Hey guys, welcome to the Jesus King Podcast. I'm here with Abraham. Thank God, Abraham, we, we've got you for a few videos. Yeah, man. So it's yeah, good to see yeah. your face. Yeah. Um, in this topic, in this video, uh, we're speaking about the assurance of salvation, mm. right? Obviously, there is a spectrum. Some people believe that you commit one sin, you're, you're mm. outside of the grace. Yeah. You need to repent, and if you repent... Or ask forgiveness, you're back in the game, um, and you've got the other side it's like where a ping ping pong kind of thing. Like, you know, lost salvation, <laughs> got some lost love. Yeah, so you're in and out like maybe ten, twenty times a yeah. day. Yeah, right. Um, and then obviously you have the other side, which I don't hold to. Uh, neither do I hold to this extreme, mm. but I don't hold to the other extreme where they say, once you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You're That's once it. saved, you're always, always saved. saved. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you can go through whatever season in your life, um, whatever disobedience that's going to come, obviously, in, in your walk with Christ. Jesus has already saved you. Mm -hmm. He already loves you. And no matter what, you're saved. Yeah. Yeah. So do you hold to that? <laughs> so the, see, the, those are the two kind of extremes. And I think their reaction is so the first the first example you gave about <clears throat> i committed a sin and now i'm yep. not saved that flows from the catholic ideal right mm. it flows from the catholic ideal of confession penitence and you know indulgences in order to save your soul from sin right because every single week every day in day out we sin whether in mind or deed or in any other way and so the Catholics ha held that view that, all right, well, we need to go to confession, we need to do the Hail Marys, and we need to pay indulgences and, and those kind of things. So that kind of flows out. The other extreme of once saved, always saved is a reaction to the Catholic ideal, right? Because they're like, well, that's not biblical, so maybe we need to search the scriptures yeah. and talk about. Boom. Cool. So the other extreme. Yeah. Both of them don't have that balance of the scriptures. Um, Cause I, I remember like I grew up in a church and in a situation where it was more like the first example where we're talking about like, if you've sinned, like you, you can believe wholeheartedly in the doctrine of Christ and mm -hmm. in the message of the gospel and you believe in Christ and trust in him for your salvation, which what does that do? It produces the righteousness of God, right? Mm -hmm. And you're saved and you're regenerated and you're rebirthed, right? Born again. You can have all that, but let's say you lost it after a woman, or let's say you've fallen into a certain sin, or you lied, or you did it. you're no longer in that grace anymore. That okay. was the viewpoint. Oh, right. And that's what, like, so, so I heard people saying as I was growing up, I was 14, 15, I'm like, man, I'm scared here. Like, I'm going to lose my salvation any moment, any day. And so I needed to come to God. And that produces a work-based kind of salvation hmm. um, form, format kind of thing in your life. So you have to begin to like really, really work hard at not sinning. Okay. Right? Otherwise you fall out of grace. So did God. you hide yourself in a cave or Man, something? I tell, I tell <laughs> you, like I... I, but it, what it does, it produces hypocrisy because you have to have the image outwardly that you are good, that mm -hmm. you're not doing anything wrong so that you can show others that, oh, no, I am still in the grace of God. You yeah. get me? And so that is not healthy. That's not a biblical model of salvation. And that's not the, that's not the will of God in your salvation. He wants you to have confidence that you are saved, that you are his, so, that you are loved by him. So basically your status of salvation was according to your obedience yeah yeah that's the whole point it's a work-based model so it's nothing different to what we see in the mosaic law where you're like all right well if you've done this then you're cut off from israel right yeah like, so so that was the danger mm. and that's the reason i i think we should speak about it because i think there are a lot of christians who are still in that model mindset. of church and mindset and maybe they have certain pastors or teachers who are teaching this it's a work-based model and it does not produce the righteousness of God either. And you can't, like, you cannot have an assurance of salvation in that. If you believe that at any point in your day 
or weak, or even if you have a season where you just feel very spiritually weak, you can't have confidence in your salvation because it's based on your work and your actions, mm. right? Yeah, not okay. the actions of Christ. Which is why a lot of people kind of who who deal with this problem, they, they have a question. For example, like if you've lied, you cross the street, you got hit by a car. That's right. That's you're right. Gone. See, we've had these discussions with a lot of. Um, I remember a lot, of, like back in the day, a lot of the guys, and they, they would ask these questions because it's it's a genuine curiosity. Like, yeah. let's say you're a believer and you've just committed adultery, and then you get hit by a bus. Or like, let's say you're a believer and you committed suicide. So yeah. where do you go? Do you yeah. get me? So there are those tricky questions, and you're like, well, let's hold back, hold up. Let what what do the scriptures say here? Where's the assurance of salvation and where's the line, the delineation between being assured of your salvation and then crossing over and making shipwreck of your faith, like Paul speaks about, mm. right? Because Paul does say that there were men, Hymenaeus and Alexander and certain other men who made shipwreck of their faith, which means they were in the faith and now they're no longer, they're apostates. Yeah. And then they speak about the great apostasy. There are going to be people who are in the fold no longer. So how do you, I'll ask you the question as, you know, as a minister, how do you reconcile the two truths? How do you reconcile that, you know, we can have assurance in our salvation, yeah. but then also that you can make shipwreck of your yeah. faith? So, so what I believe is, it's not that whether you've committed a certain sin mm. today, that's going to take you out of the grace is as long as you have a savior, those sins are covered. So as long as you have Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, mm. Jesus, by by his nature, mm. as, as being a Savior, always is covering your sins. Not to say that you go and Take go sin yeah. and stuff like that, because Paul says Paul that sin. in first, uh, not first Romans, shall Romans we sin, 6. Shall we sin that yeah. grace may abound? Yeah. So, yeah. so the idea that we, we live in holiness, we pursue God's nature in our lives, we walk as Christ walked, but then there will be along the way um, moments of weaknesses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in those moments of weaknesses, we are still children of God. Yeah. We are still saved by grace. As long as there is a savior, what I feel that a person becomes non-Christian, non-believer, is when he forsakes the savior. Amen. Once you take the savior out of the equation, yeah. there's no salvation. I was really hoping we'd disagree here. Oh, well, why? Yeah. What were you? Because we've never we've never disagreed. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, well, well that, that to be honest with you, because mm -hmm. we had a a, a sister in, in the church yesterday. Yeah. She did bring up um, Romans 8, mm. right? And, and and she does believe a person can forfeit their salvation because there's a lot of passages on that. Yeah. And she says, but the Bible says nothing can separate us from yeah. the love of God. Yeah. And I was sharing with her from a first century context yeah. that, for example, in Judaism, um, if you did not pay your temple taxes, mm. you could not perform the things in the temple. You could not worship. You yeah. could not have yeah. fellowship. You could not even offer your sacrifices. So therefore, who's standing between you and God is the priests, the Pharisees, right? So you feel like, hey, if I don't please these people, I'll be separated from God. Yeah. But yeah. then Jesus comes and says, no, no, no one can separate yeah. you from I'm the mediator here. Yeah. 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 And Paul says the same thing, you know, because these guys, not, not some of them came from a Jew Jewish background, but others who were Gentiles, very similar. Mm. If you cast me out of the temple... I can't worship my deity. That's right. Therefore, there is a person that has the power to separate me, right? Mm -hmm. But in Christianity, if you are with God, there is not a single person in the church mm. or outside the church, neither angels or demons that can come and say, I can cut your relationship off yeah. from God. Like, like what we're talking about is there's nothing external. Yeah. That can come and pull and pluck you yeah. out. Because yeah. like you, we have passages that God says, you know, they're, they're in my hand and nothing will pluck them out. You know, yeah. they're engraved in the palm of my hand. So like there's nothing external that can come in and, you know, like, you know, like a like a vulture that comes and picks up a baby and, you know, and goes. takes them away. Yeah. yeah. So as long as you, you, you look up to Christ, there's nothing in between mm. that can come and separate you. 
and, and, and that's that's God's faithfulness. Mm. The the way I like to share it, because especially when we share these verses about God saying nothing is going to take you away from me, nothing is going to separate you away from me. I'm like these are His vows. Yeah, yeah. Like mm -mm. A, as a husband. When you stand before the church, you're giving your vows, right? Mm -hmm. You say, through thick and thin, richer or poorer, and I will be with you till we die, right? Yeah. That's the vows. So if the husband makes those vows, do you think the bride will look at them and be like, oh, it's impossible for me to cheat on him? Mm -hmm. No. She's got to perform her vows, yeah. right? Yeah. That's why you look at, for example, Hebrews 3, Hebrews 6, Hebrews 10, Romans 11, mm. John 15 speaks about, okay, you're grafted in. Like, yeah. for example, Romans 11, you're grafted in a, as a branch. The branch does not support the root. The root yeah. supports the branch. Now, if you're going to have a haughty spirit against the natural branches, which were the Jews, mm -hmm. the Israelites, don't you think that God can can take you away too? Yeah. So if he, if he, in their disobedience, if, if it didn't... Uh, stop God from pulling them out. Don't you think it's going to happen the yeah. same with you? Yeah. Hebrews 3 says that if there is anyone with an unbelieving heart in departing from the living God, uh, living God, saying that's why daily encourage each mm. other. So sin can bring us to a place where we are so dead that we look at Christ and we're like, we no longer want you. Yeah. And the moment you take away the Savior away from the equation, there's no salvation. Mm. As long as the Savior is there, in our walk with God, there are hiccups, there are weaknesses, there are sins. They're all covered covered by the Savior. Mm. That's what you see in First John uh, chapter 1, yeah. verse 8 to 10. It says that if we come to Christ, He is faithful to forgive. Amen. And yeah. He continues on, He's saying... Let no one say that they are without a sin, yeah, because yeah. they are making themselves. They are liars, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So I, I was going to say this is this is a very important aspect of your spiritual growth in your spiritual life because I think that for the majority of people, especially when they're newer Christians, maybe a few mm. years in the faith, yeah, they will have days where they feel like maybe I'm not even saved, right? Mm. Maybe like I feel a bit far from God, I'm not feeling the presence as I felt earlier on. Maybe I'm not saved. Maybe he has left me. But they still believe in the gospel. Yeah. They still believe in Christ. They still believe that he is the savior of the world, yeah. right? Can, can I share something on that? Yeah. Um, because it's definitely very discouraging when you see people like that. I always flip it around and I say, if someone comes to you, and they say, I'm a good person. I feel like I'm going to go to heaven. Yeah. What's your response? You'll be yeah. like, you don't have Jesus exactly. as your savior. So therefore you need Jesus to be saved. I said, but they felt they were saved. Yeah. Yeah. So if you don't feel like you're not saved, why are you going according to your emotions? Yeah. Yeah. You know that in the Bible, that if you receive Jesus as your Lord and your savior, you are a new creation. That's what Second Corinthians says, that those who are in Christ are a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. So if you are a new creation, you've been saved, your sins have been washed away, yeah. and all these things that you have received blessings in Christ, why would you let your feelings dictate the promises of the exactly. Bible in your life? Exactly. So what I do then... I just say that as a as to bring awareness. Once they have that awareness, I say, okay, your problem is not a salvation problem. Your problem is in, internal, your feelings. The devil is attacking your feelings, your, mind. your emotions, placing doubts in your life. Okay, why don't we deal with that? Mm -hmm. Once we deal with that, then it's basically like, you know, waking up. Yeah. And you're like hazy, you're like, I need to wash my face, get myself ready. Let's go through that process yeah. yeah once your eyes are wide open you've had your coffee and you're like oh okay it was just a bad day just a right? bad, yeah or bad yeah. morning or bad morning right <laughs> yeah so so to me it's more like it's not whether you've you you're not saved or you're saved you are in christ you you're have saved. eternity in your life and what do you say what's the basis of that salvation it's the works of christ not yours yeah this is the, the this is the big thing here. ephesians 2 right yeah. it's we're saved 
by, by grace, grace through faith, faith, not of works. So I'm not waking up every day thinking God is giving me my KPIs, yeah. my list of <laughs> what I need to do, and I better get and it done. And what not to do. Especially. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and what not to do. Otherwise, I don't have salvation. Yeah. No, I do have salvation in Christ. And because I am saved, I am able to serve God. Mm. It, serving God is not, I'm not doing God a, a favor by serving God. No, mm. I actually, I am honored and I have the opportunity to serve him. Mm. That's another topic we can maybe it's, speak it's about an, that. But, it's another topic. And I think, yeah. I do think it's just to touch on here. We talk about the source, mm. right? And then the overflowing, the outflowing of the yeah. source versus trying to acquire the source, okay, right? Yeah. So like what what I mean by that is when Jesus says you're saved, it's like he says there's a well of living water, there's living water that flows out and bubbles mm -hmm. out, right? Um, when we look at salvation, that's what it is. It's the source of all goodness that comes out and produces the fruit. Yeah. Right. It's not like we have to produce the fruit and we have to work in order to plant the tree and then produce the fruit and then we're accepted by God. Mm -hmm. Right. And this is a lot of the the idea that this kind of ideology of like this 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 um, attitude of well I I can't sin and I need to do good works in order that God may approve me. Yeah. So just like That's Romans it. four five yeah. says, the one who does not work but believes, but believes, his faith is accounted as righteousness. And you you mentioned Hebrews ten, and I wanted to quickly go there because this is a passage that a lot of the people in this kind of, oh, um, you know, uh, if you sin after you have been saved, then you're no longer saved, then the sacrifice of Christ is no longer valid. That kind of thing, because they will use Hebrews chapter ten to validate that claim and so I'll, I'll read quickly just this part yeah. here in hebrews 10 26 it says for if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins yeah. now you read that verse on its own that's scary right? yeah. because it says if we sin willfully i mean every sin is a willful sin right it is, yeah <laughs> if no we're sin... putting a gun on your yeah. head and say if we sin willfully after we come to the knowledge of truth there is no longer a sacrifice mm. that remains for that sin. Yeah. So you take that verse and a lot of preachers will say it. They'll say, those of you that have fallen into adultery or you've fallen into lies or you've fallen into fraud or whatever the, whatever the sin may be that you commit against God after you've become saved, that there no longer is a sacrifice for sin. And again, we say context matters, yeah. right? The scriptures matter. The words that it says matters mm. because the entire book of Hebrews, what is it talking about? It's talking about the people in Israel who, after having the knowledge of who God is, they fell away and they made forfeiture of their faith in God mm. and started worshiping false idols. They completely, completely rejected God. Yeah. That's what Paul, uh, that all, yeah, not Paul, but whoever, writer, whoever wrote yeah. Hebrews, which, you know, I think it's inspired by some of Paul's teachings. But anyway. Yeah. Um, Do you believe it's Paul? I believe that someone who was a disciple of Paul wrote it. Oh, okay. Because I, I don't think it's Paul. No, myself. I don't think it's Paul. Oh, but if, I thought if, we if, could if, disagree there. No, there no. you go. <laughs> but I do think it was a disciple. <laughs> okay. Either way. Um, so the people of uh, what he's, what the writer is saying is, so in this situation, you've accepted Christ, right? And you're like the people of Israel who have been delivered from slavery. But now what you're doing is after you've received the knowledge of Christ and you've come to faith in him, if you now reject him completely, all right? This is where we talk, where, where we're veering on to the blasphemy of the spirit kind of situation. You've made shipwreck of your faith and there no longer is a sacrifice there. Because you've rejected the one who made the sacrifice for you, right? And so you're outside of the fold. And so this is where we're like, all right, this is where theology does matter. And understanding the scriptures matters because you can't just pluck a verse out and say, nope, that's what it says. Because if you do that, then you're going to be very, very, very unassured in your salvation. You're yeah. not going to have a lot of confidence here. This is not talking about just the, the minute sins you will, you will 
make every day. Yeah. Because you you compare that to First John, where it says, "If you say you have no sin, then you're a liar." You're a liar. Yeah, right. Um, it's interesting because verse twenty, because uh, you read twenty six, yeah. twenty seven. Yeah, yeah. read the, the rest of the context. Yeah, you see that he's saying that if someone sins under the law, mm -hmm. uh, if there is two or three witnesses, that person will be punished and yeah. even by death. It's saying how much more worse it is if you if you can read maybe verse 29. 29. So how yeah. much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and this is the part, insulted the Spirit of grace. Yeah. So it's like a willful rejection mm. of the gospel. That's the gospel there. You're and, willfully rejecting yeah. it now. What's also interesting, because people can look at that and be like, oh, no, that's just God kind of um, disciplining you as a child. But no, then if no, you no, continue, no. it says that it's about the vengeance, the vengeance of God. Vengeance is mine. Yeah. I will replace, says the Lord. So, so, so you become an enemy now yeah. of God. To, to people, because I've heard this view before, they're like, oh, no, this is for Jewish people. I'm like, when did the Jews trample the son of no. uh, uh, the blood of the son well, of God. when did they come to the knowledge of yeah. him and then trample? and being sanctified by him yeah so speaking about christians mm -hmm. he, the the earlier part he speaks about the jews under the law of moses but then he starts to move on to us yeah who we are so um we don't have too much left um one good question w would be appropriate to ask as as we're coming to the end of it um what would your encouragement be to a person that feels like, um, I know what the Bible's promises are. Mm. Um, uh, I'm not gullible in the sense that I'm just going to go live my life because I'm saved because I've made a confession. No, I, I know that if I hide in my heart, as it says in Hebrews mm -hmm. 3, that I will depart from the living God. Mm. I don't know where I am. Yeah. I really don't know where I am. Could you help me navigate my way to 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 say, all right, this is a first step I can take and 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 kind of restore my relationship with God, restore my mind, mm. restore my heart in the sense of my feelings and my anxieties, my doubts, because I, I actually came across a person like this and that person knew his Bible inside out. Yeah, I'm not yeah. good. Could it's, it not, be... it's not a knowledge thing there. Yeah. You know? yeah. I said, could it be like maybe you have a sin in your life that's bringing all these doubts? And it's like, dude, I don't have it, but every day I'm waking up, I really don't know. I, I don't know if I'm saved or not. Mm. And, and, and that was a lot of... Um... My encouragement would be this. Don't put your assurance, don't, don't base your assurance and your confidence in your salvation on what other people are saying or by on what you're feeling, right? Base it on the truths of scripture, because if you truly believe, you know, we know the gospel. If you truly believe Jesus is the universal savior, he is the savior, he is the Lord of mankind, that his blood has the power and the authority to wipe away your sins and to justify you before God. If you have that belief and you, if you, are in him whether you feel it or not like if you have that true faith in him there's nothing there's nothing there outside of your rejection of him that is going to separate you and so you need to preach to yourself and this is one of the tricks i was i was thinking about this one of the things that kind of like when you talk about soldiers who are in active duty they're always on the go right they're always moving they're always they have this mission in their mind that they're they're ready for war. They're out there. They have a common purpose. When they're off duty, they're still soldiers. When they're off duty, though, they're not as alert, right? Mm. There are a lot of Christians who they believe the gospel, they believe in in Christ, but they're not actively ministering for Christ. Mm. And so what ends up happening, they feel a bit lazy, they feel a bit inactive, spiritually speaking, and then they feel like they're not really producing the works of God, right? Which flows out of your salvation. And that gives them the illusion that they're not saved. Do you get me? Yeah. And so because they're not active, they're not very alert. 
one of the tricks of God, which I, I won't say tricks, but one of the methods of God is as you are ministering, you are preaching not only to the world, you're preaching the same truths that you believe to yourself as well. And you're encouraging your own spirit and your own heart. So I would encourage you, don't base it on your own emotions and how you're feeling. Base it on what the scriptures say and preach the truth to yourself daily and preach the truth to others as well, in spite of how you're feeling. Mm. And you will see a change because faith comes by what? By hearing the words. Hearing, yeah. And that faith will increase. The faith, the trust, that confidence that you are saved will increase as you preach, as you're reading the word, as you're, as you're, as you're offloading the word to others as well. You know, when I'm one, some of the moments that have touched me the most is when I'm on the pulpit and I'm preaching and I say something that really wasn't from my own words. It was from the word of God and it preaches back to me. It's like it hits the wall and comes straight back at me, mm. touches my heart, encourages me, and then just motivates and empowers, right? That's a common thing for preachers. Sometimes yeah. you're preaching to yourself as well. <laughs> for real. No, no. It, yeah. That's the reality check yeah. there. And one that's one of the amazing things when you're ministering whether it be teaching, preaching, worshiping, whatever it may be, you're ministering to your spirit as well. Your spirit is being ministered and it increases that faith and that confidence, right? So this is one of the reasons why in the book of Hebrews and throughout the scriptures, it says, do not forsake the assembling of believers either. You do that, you become an island and there's no one to really encourage you and sharpen you and give you that assurance that, you know, you're my brother. You know, yeah. that kind of thing. There's a danger in becoming isolated and not doing the works of God because then you do not have that in that um validation and verification of what you believe. You know? Yeah, cool. Um my encouragement you you've you've given a really great one. Just something so simple. Um, because as you were speaking, it reminded me of when the disciples and Jesus were in the middle of the storm. Mm. Jesus was sleeping, right? Sometimes life can be very chaotic, yeah. spiritually speaking. Different and, seasons. Yeah, and you feel like, if I am a Christian, why am I, why is my headspace feel like this? It feels like there's a big storm in my head, yeah. whether I am a Christian or not. But notice in the story, where was Jesus? He was in the boat. So he was there. He was sleeping. He's quiet. But then all you there. need to do is go to him. Jesus, wake up, save me. Jesus wakes up, comes the storm in a second. And what happens? They were so shocked. Mm -hmm. They worshipped him. They were like, how, how could the wind and the storm listen to him? Mm -hmm. So I would like you to ask yourself that same very question. Can my doubts, my anxieties, my, um, you know, my false sense of, of feeling that I am lost, I am without Christ. Could those be obedient to Christ? Yeah. Yes, they can. All these thoughts can be obedient by in Christ, and Christ can calm them down. So that's my encouragement. Go yeah, to Christ. Say, Christ, like I'm, I'm feeling like I'm lost. I'm feeling like I'm, I'm in the middle of a storm. I love you, but I don't know if I'm saved or not. See what Jesus can do in your yeah. life. Yeah. yeah. So, God bless you. We'll see you next time.